Wil uh, welcome back on behalf of Gen Master in Chief Jimmy. Uh, this is uh, the Roger video 25, Normal Labor and Delivery, part 2. And now we discuss the stages 2 and 3 of labor. The overview, second and third stage. First we define both stages. What uh, assessment can be done and should be done regarding the mother and the fetus. How we would, would we manage second and third stage safely. Then we discuss the so-called cardinal movement of the fetus. The duration of the second stage. Uh, for the important emotional support and pain management I refer back to part one. And then what management options do we have for the stirp? third stage and of course that will always as always be evidence informed and then a number of conclusions. Second stage commences where the cervix is fully dilated and the mother starts, starts to push. Eventually it finishes when the baby is born. So pushing is um, what the mother should be encouraged to do in order to expel her baby. Fascinating to see how uh, the effort is clearly visible on the face of this woman. Um, she is um, on the one hand um, very uh, maybe scared a little bit but on the other hand high expectations because she knows now that within a limited time frame her baby will be on her chest. The expulsion, delivery of the baby, commences. So the expulsion takes place when the mother pushes uh, together with the uterine contractions, with the labor pain. There are two options. One is the Vazelva pushing, where the mother, mother to be, takes a deep breath in, holds her breath, and pushes as long and hard as she can in synchrony with the contraction. Ideally, the glottis is closed, so no noise, no screaming. Uh, the woman is actually encouraged by the uh, um, accusure, by the midwife or the doctor, and more or less directed. The second approach is more what is called spontaneous pushing, and that responds to involuntary urge. So the woman listens to her body, the involuntary urge, which is caused by the head uh, descending onto her pelvic floor, and she starts pushing from a resting respiratory volume. And it's okay to make some noise so the, the vocal cords are open. What should be the preferred method of the two? Well, there is one uh, study, uh, a systematic review of three other studies uh, involving low-risk, healthy, nalreprous women with an uncomplicated pregnancy and a gestational age of at least 36 weeks. And important for us to know, uh, there was no epidural analgesia on board. Study from the Netherlands. Um, when you look at the total duration of the second stage and you compare the patients, uh, the, the Verzelva pushing resulted in a second stage which was on average 18 and a half minutes shorter compared to the natural pushing. If we compare, and that's probably more relevant, what is now the risk that the second stage has to be supported by an obstetrician by doing an instrumental vaginal delivery, a forceps or a ventouse delivery, then we can see, um, if you look at the, the diamond here, the diamond here crosses the one line, uh, it's not significant, there's a 30% reduced risk, but it's a trend, it's not significant, in favor of spontaneous pushing, we have to realize that this review uh, contained relatively small numbers and in a very specific group of women. But I think it's an interesting finding. The outcomes um, in both groups the, were not different for the fetus, similar APCA scores, comparable umbilical artery pHs, and for the mother, no difference in perineal tears or overall satisfaction. I would like now to move to the so-called cardinal movements of the fetus. I'm personally very glad that I don't remember the dangerous passage between the scylla and charybdis. 
into this into the outside world at all a very narrow passage and um, you see the picture of Scylla and Charybdis uh, you might know it from the famous uh, book from Homer the Odyssey I regard um, I regard the, the stage two for the fetus of liberty as speleology how does the fetus actually move through the narrows of the maternal pelvis which consists of bones muscles and ligaments it must have been scary and glad we don't remember here is a diagram where we see on the left hand side the onset of labor one of the first movements the baby makes is flexion of the head so the chin to the chest and this will reduce the diameter of the fetal head so the most favorable the, the minimal space taking position is flexion of the head then we see here the baby is now facing sidewards this is where the baby is LOT and now the, the neck is rotating so the baby is rotating 90 degrees and that's what we call the internal rotation later on we have the opposite movement when the baby's head is born extension of the neck and restitution or external rotation of the head I would like to explain this a little bit further when we take a closer look at the fetal scalp we can see here uh, the occiput of the baby, the posterior fontanelle where three suture lines meet and that's different from the anterior fontanelle depicted here where you see that four suture lines uh, meet so the posterior fontanelle can be felt as a triangle while this is more like a diamond on the right hand side we see the biparatal diameter of 9.5 cm on average and that's the smallest part of the head circumference of the baby and this is what um, will happen when you look at the shape of the baby's head that the internal rotation is in accommodation to the pelvic inlet which is widest in the left right diameter and the pelvic outlet which is widest in the anterior posterior diameter here are a few more diagrams the first one of the first cardinal movements is engagement the baby's head will descend into the pelvis descends further and eventually will descend completely and that means in this diagram the head is cannot be felt anymore abdominally at the same time uh, we see flexion of the head as we discussed already and important when you look at when you would do an internal vaginal examination this is where the baby's posterior fontanelle is at the roughly two o'clock position which we refer to LOT then the internal rotation takes place there is flexion in the neck and we see eventually when the internal rotation is complete then we're dealing with the posterior fontanelle at the 12 o'clock position which is called uh, OA occiput anterior so this is this is the way with internal examination how we can follow the internal rotation flexion of the head depicted once more the chin to the chest so that the most favorable diameter of the head will in this example pass through the pelvic inlet and the baby's head is sideways so this is called ROT right occiput transverse a few more other diagrams we see the extension now taking place as after the head the head is crowning here the head is now visible in the vulva and this uh, diagram number six we see the external rotation where the head moves again to looking sideways back to the original position at the pelvic inlet and the delivery of the anterior and the posterior shoulder this is the picture when the head is what we call starts to crown starts to be visible in the vulva and does not uh, go backwards when there is no pushing anymore the woman feels a stinging and burning sensation important to explain that to her otherwise she might uh, be discouraged to continue to push um, at this stage when the head is about to crown it's important that we start controlling the pushing by intermittently in uh, requesting the mother to be 
to push gently and to pan, to push and to pan. At this stage, it's important that the accoucheur builds a what I call a joint venture with um, the pregnant uh, woman, and that uh, the entourage is actually no longer uh, cheering her on. So it's important that this is that both the delivery of the head should take place in a very controlled manner. Quite often, if that's not uh, the case, the baby's head is like an explosion through the perineum and the result might be an avoidable third or fourth degree tear. Delivery of the anterior shoulder, beautiful diagrams from the book Obstetrische Interventions from the Netherlands. Um, we can see here the, on the left hand side the delivery of the anterior shoulder. This is how the hands grasp on the lateral side of the head and gently downward traction while the mother is encouraged to push. This is how the anterior shoulder should be born and the posterior shoulder important that it takes place in a very controlled way comparable to um, the, the, when the head is crowning. So gentle pushing, gentle panting and very slowly the posterior shoulder is born while the head is slightly moved upward. Here, when this, this delivery of the posterior shoulder takes place too enthusiastically, too abruptly, the third and fourth degree tear are looming. And then the expulsion, where the baby is extracted uh, following the direction of the, uh, the pelvic, the birth canal, which is slightly upward. And then we see what is still fascinating, fascinating every time this uh, baby girl vigorously crying I'm not happy why didn't you leave me inside she appears to say but we are all very thrilled if this is how the baby is born because this is what we want to achieve a good outcome for the baby and the mother the second stage how long should it last for that's a very important question and um, there are different ways quite often based on tradition of birthing units Let's assume that the fetal heart rate or the fetal heart rate pattern is within normal range. How long before we declare failure to progress FTP? There is in what I would call a hidden rule in some obstetrical units in Australia, don't take offense, for a nulliparous woman where the hidden rule appears to be after 60 minutes, well, it's failure to progress and it's time for us to intervene and offer her a ventouse or a forcep delivery. What about the practice and the evidence overseas? Let's be honest, um, delivering a baby is truly a balancing act. On one hand side, we should wait and be patient. We should mother nature to allow to do his job. And this is the predominant culture, uh, how w uh, midwives see um, and experience labor and delivery. On the other hand, we have the, the approach act. Um, be careful because if you're too slow and wait too long, there might be a poor outcome, a poor APCA score, poor umbilical RTP ages, the cerebral, cerebral palsy risk, whilst we know that's mainly caused by antenatal um, events, there might be a birth trauma to the mother and the baby and there's always the fear for litigation and also it's part of the culture of which we tend to see in among doctors p2 square 2 medicine where pills and procedures is what we are taught to do and not acting is not our strength quite often interesting despite the fact that the intervention rates of ventus and forceps and cesarean sections have gone up over time in Australia. Mind you, the caesarean section rate, so the planned elective caesarean section and the urgent caesarean section combined are hovering around the 30% in Australia. Despite this increase in interventions, we have not seen a reduction in the perinatal morbidity and mortality. So in that regard, maybe, let's be honest, the intervention pendulum has swung too far. So 60 minutes is a very popular TV program here in Australia, but could we apply that hidden rule as well for the second stage of labor? So let's look overseas. 
a study uh, done in Canada, the country of the maple leaf, in nulliparous women, um, they found that the second stage lasted for more than three hours in 11% and even more than five hours in 2.7%. No perinatal deaths unrelated to congenital malformations were noted and there was no relationship between the duration of the second stage and low 5-minute EPCO scores, neonatal seizures or admission to the neonatal intensive care unit. So the authors of this study, published in 1996, concluded operative intervention in the second stage is not warranted merely because some set number of hours has elapsed. So not hours. Um, so the clock is not ticking for intervention. Another study from the United States by Cheng and co-workers published in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology in 2004, they looked at the mode of delivery in uh, more than 15,500 women by the duration of the second stage of labor. And the diagram here shows, shows on the y-axis the percentage of nulliparous women, so the women who delivered for the first time, and on the horizontal axis, on the x-axis, the duration of the second stage in hours. And we see the gray area, the number of women who delivered vaginally, and we can see still after between two and three hours, a considerable number of women delivered vaginally. Even after three to four hours, and even more than four hours, still some 20% of women delivered vaginally. At the same time, we see the black area the operative vaginal uh, delivery rates is going up, so from twos and forceps, and also the cesarean section rates are going up. So interesting to see that the vast majority of these primary plus women delivered not within one hour, which is the, um, the hidden rule in some Australian birthing units. Um, here, the the odds ratio to deliver vaginally in the same study was 4.3 uh, after 3 hours so and even 2.83 after 4 hours. And the odds ratio to the have a cesarean section after 3 hours of pushing were completed was 5.8 versus 5.6 after more than 4 hours. Of course, now you would ask the question, well, Alphonse, Show me the outcomes for mother and baby. Yes, sure. The next slide shows um, over time again, between time blocks of one hour, zero to one, one to two, two to three, two to four, and more than four hours. Firstly, the top, the squares represent the risk that the delivery will result in a third or fourth degree tear. That risk after more than four hours of pushing increases significantly. The closed triangle, the postpartum hemorrhage risk, does not increase significantly. Chorea amnionitis risk increased significantly, and endomyometritis does not increase significantly. There is no relationship with the duration of the second stage. What about the neonatal outcomes? Same diagram here, uh, and we see the Admission to the intensive care unit, EPCA score less than 7, meconium and um, umbilical artery do, uh, pH base excess, or the base excess less than mi minus 12 and the um umbilical artery pH less than 7.0. All these short-term neonatal outcomes, there was no difference with the duration of the second stage. So there is no convincing argument to look at the clock after one or two hours and say let's stop pushing because the baby is the baby is at risk. So the short-term neonatal morbidity does not make a difference depending, there's no relationship with the duration of the second stage. Now let's go back to the official statements of colleges. Our Renskog statement, which was published in July 2014, states that normal second stage for a primary gravida, that should be actually an early per a leprous woman is up to two hours and up to one hour for multi gravida. When these times are exceeded, assessment should occur with the view to correcting dystocia of affecting delivery. 
dystocia is another way to say failure to descend, failure to progress. What though do our American college state? Their college, based on their research, as that shown, tells clearly in a nulliparous woman without an epidural, it's safe and responsible to push for at least two hours. In case of an epidural on board, it's okay to push for three hours. And for a uh, woman who had a child, at least one child in the past, vaginally, it's, um, it's one hour and two hours, respectively, without and with epidural. So the Americans are amazingly much more patient than we tend to be. If you want to look um, at a video of uh, the second stage, I recommend the video of Alison's journey. Alison was so kind to record her uh, labor and delivery in an American hospital. By the way, I understand that she was induced for suspected intrauterine growth restriction. And my goodness, she had a very quick labor and delivery. Total active labor was an hour and a half and the second chase was just nine minutes. So uh, this shows that without intervention, mother nature can, be very, uh, can do a very good job. Maybe it was because of the baby was small. Uh, I have not been able to pick up the, the birth weight of the baby. But here is the link and this video is wholeheartedly recommended. Let's now move to stage three. Now stage three uh, commences with the delivery of the baby and finishes when the placenta, the membranes and the umbilical cord are born. There's also a video where I took this uh, sh a screenshot from. There's a link where you can see um, the delivery of the placenta. Here we see the, the fetal part of the placenta covered by membranes just about to be born, just to be, uh, to be delivered. The physiology, exactly the same mechanisms continue to work. Oxytocin and prostaglandin hormones are responsible for the continued uterine contraction during the st third stage of labor. That means that the placenta will be dislodged from the decidua, the, the placenta will be detached and eventually uh, can be delivered. So, um, usually the placenta is born by a combination of the uterine contractions in combination with maternal effort. They result in the expelling the placenta. Um, important to note that the maternal blood loss is limited by the compression of the spiral arteries um, of the uterus as they pass through the mesh of uterine muscles of the upper segment of the uterus. So the uterine contraction is the primary hemostatic mechanism preventing all women to exsanguinate after the baby and the placenta are born. The definition of normal blood loss in a, in a vaginal delivery is 600 milliliters and we all know that measuring or the estimation of blood loss is a rough approximation, it's not very reliable at all. I would like now to discuss two ways to manage the third stage. It's a so-called expectant management versus active management. What do we mean by active management and expected management? In active management, three things are done. Firstly, a eutrotonic drug is administered, either syntocinone or ergometrin or syntometrin, which is a combination of the two intermuscularly or intravenously. And that, the, that this takes place as soon as the anterior shoulder of the baby is born. As soon as the baby is born, early cord clamping takes place and controlled cord traction to deliver the placenta. Expectant management, um, that means we wait until we can see signs of separation of the placenta and there are two signs. One is there is a little gush of blood visible. And th secondly, we can see at the level of the vulva that the umbilical cord moves slightly outward. And that's a sign that the placenta has separated. And for if, if that's the case, the placenta is delivered just by encouraging the mother to push. 
so we keep our hands on our backs, so to speak. And that seems to be very difficult and challenging. Then let's look at the research. Which of these two methods should be recommended? Which is safer or better? For the length of the third stage, that's, there's no difference. For the total blood loss, more than one liter, and I'm referring here to a systematic review, a Cochrane database review, review published in 2015 of Begley and colleagues, it shows uh, when we combine all the studies, we can see here the one line, on the left-hand side of the one line, that would favor active management of the third stage. On the right-hand side of the one line, that would mean favor expected management. If we add up all the studies, if we combine it, this um, diagram, this diamond shows that active management results in a 66% lower chance to have blood loss more than one liter. The same would apply to blood loss more than 500 milliliters. The same would apply to the total blood loss during labor and delivery and also the need for red packet cell blood transfusion. So I think that are, those findings are clinically relevant. So significantly reduce blood loss when we do active management. So based on this, that should be the first choice. However, we need to realize that the, there is some side effects and I think I will discuss that later. The umbilical cord, should we clamp the umbilical cord early as is part of the uh, active management, or is it better to delay the cord clamping until, we, uh, un until there is no more umbilical artery pulsation fells, felt? By the way, of note is here that this baby, um, this baby had actually a, a true cord in the umbilical cord, a true knot in the umbilical cord, but apparently uh, that did not affect uh, his condition at all. Here we see the study comparing early with late clamping of the umbilical cord and the outcome here uh, was um, the total blood loss, that did make no difference, sorry. Now we see the next diagram where uh, the researchers compared the hemoglobin of the infant at one to two days after birth and there is a slightly higher hemoglobin with late clamping of the umbilical cord. 1.49 grams per deciliter. Um, does early or late clamping have an influence on the risk of the baby having uh, high bilirubin levels, so uh, neonatal jaundice requiring phototherapy? Yes. Uh, here, early clamping results in a 38% reduced relative risk uh, of requiring phototherapy. So early and late clamping have speci specific pros and cons, but all in all, we feel that early clamping as part of the active management of the third stage does not have very significant clinical disadvantages. Here we see the controlled core traction. The, the hands are actually making sure that the uterus does not, is, is not inverted, is not co collapsing and coming down. We make sure that the uterus is well contracted and with the um, left hand side, which is not depicted here, we gently pull while uh, the cord uh, outward whilst the mother is pushing. Controlled cord traction, by the way, does not make any difference itself to the risk of having blood loss more than one liter. So it's not the controlled cord traction, but apparently the uterotonic administration which has this effect. By the way, controlled core traction contributes to a lower risk of re needing a manual removal of the placenta. We can see here in this systematic review, Cochrane review, that the risk is uh, decreased by a 31%. How long should the third stage last for? Uh, in some French uh, countries they advocate for less than 30 minutes so if the placenta is not delivered uh, at 30 minutes they um, would proceed with offering a manual removal which means going to theater 
top of, of the epidural or a general anesthetic. Here um, it shows that it, uh, if you look at the total blood loss of more than 500 milliliters, the third stage shorter than or equal to 30 minutes means you would slightly reduce the blood loss from more than 500 milliliters by a 7% um, range. But however, there is no use in difference in additional ecotonics. There's no difference in blood transfusion, maternal death, severe morbidity, operative procedure or maternal satisfaction. So there is no compelling arguments to shorten the third stage less or equal to 30 minutes. Another question is breastfeeding or nipple stimulation. The thought behind this is that would stimulate the production of uh, oxytocin from the posterior pituitary gland. However, the studies done are of poor quality, as is shown in this Cochrane review, which um, was published uh, earlier this year. And the, 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 the early breastfeeding or the, su the suckling of the baby or nipple stimulation made no difference to the blood loss more than 500 milliliters. By the way, it has obviously no clinical benefit or harm, so I think personally, whilst that is not evaluated, most of us would think that it is positive early uh, attachment of the baby for the bonding between the mother and her baby. So 60 minutes appears to be appropriate for the third stage of labor. I would like to conclude now. Second stage, Vazelva pushing shortens the second stage by an average of 18 and a half minutes. Spontaneous pushing, there is a trend to lower instrumental vaginal birth. By the way, in non-epidural low risk nulliparous women, and the numbers of those studies were relatively small, a little over 200 women in both um, approaches. Based on the best available evidence of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, yes, um, nulliparous women, it's responsible and safe if they have no epidural on board to push for two hours and with an epidural to push for three hours. The duration of the second chain in multiparous women could be respectively one and two hours without and with epidural. So it's probably a very important message of this um, video. Same outcome for mother and baby. Uh, so there is no need to shorten the second stage after an hour or an hour and a half. Important that um, we know the different mechanisms which we need, which we can follow by digital vaginal examination, especially the internal rotation and the descent, to ensure that the normal passage of the fetus takes place where descent and flexion of the head and internal rotation are the most important cardinal movements. Control delivery of the fetal head and the posterior shoulder are paramount to minimize the risk for third and fourth degree tears, especially damaging the anal, internal and external sphincter muscle and the rectal mucosa in case of a fourth degree tear. Expectant and supportive management is the default in the second stage as well. And important that we should intervene only if there is clear-cut evidence that this results in better outcomes for the mother and the baby. And if not, we have to wait. The third stage, active management means administer a eutrotonic drug, early cord clamping and, cold control, and controlled cord traction. They re uh, resulted in significant reduction of blood loss and need for blood transfusion. So hence, should be the first choice. Delayed cord clamping for the neonate uh, results in a slightly higher hemoglobin and in a 33% higher chance to needing phototherapy for jaundice. Some side effects of the active management were increased vomiting, lower abdominal pain increased, uh, and it increased diastolic blood pressure more than 90 millimeters mercury. But I think these side effects are avoidable when we don't use ergometrin. Conclusions. Controlled core traction had no effect on PPH rates, but reduced the chance of women 
needing manual removing of the placenta. Nipple stimulation or immediate breastfeeding did not result in a reduction of PPA rates or placenta retention rates. They have, on the other hand, no clinical disadvantage either. So important for early bonding uh, and skin-to-skin -skin contact. This is the end of the second part of normal labor and delivery, where we discuss the, the delivery of the baby and the placenta. And um, I can assure you, I hope that you as a medical student and a junior doctor have the opportunity to witness a normal, spontaneous vaginal delivery at term with good outcomes and minimal trauma to the mother. And in the meantime, um, Jimmy is very satisfied that you uh, took the effort to complete the second part of this uh, video about normal labor and delivery. And you can see um, the animal kingdom where the very special bond between mother and her uh, still partly, partly born kangaroo is, uh, as always, very fascinating and moving to see. Thank you.